knockout. Nothing personal word of the day. It's the final day of the second to last month, the penultimate month of 2022, November 30th is the day. Knockout is the word of the day. We're going to the knockout round in case you are living under a World Cup rock or in case you've decided to not just boycott the World Cup in Qatar, you're not even paying attention to the results. I'm here for you. USA beat Iran 1-0 on a goal, late first half goal by Pulisic, who then had to go to the hospital apparently because of an abdominal injury, maybe because he got hit south of the border. Either way, he's ready for Saturday. We're ready for the round of 16 against the Netherlands, 10 a.m. on Saturday. Everybody's all jacked up. Then why am I grumpy? Grumpy's the wrong word, Coke. I'm not grumpy. A little tired. I don't love, we got to figure out a new system. I don't love the pre-taping of the show workouts because it, I'm up way, way too early. And sometimes I'm just up anyway, but when I'm sleeping and the alarm has to wake me to do a pre-show workout, that does not make me happy. And I'm not seeing the results I used to see when I was 10 years younger. But anyway, I digress. That's not why I'm grumpy. Too much garlic last night, for sure, but that's not why I'm grumpy. Hearing everybody say that soccer is about to become the national pastime, and this is not me because of my baseball background. I am more than happy to discuss the possibility that the NFL is number one, that NBA is number two, and that MLB is three, and there's a fight for three. Is there a fight with F1? Is there a fight with golf, live, PGA Tour? Is there a fight with MLS? We look at stats, youth participation. That's a popular one, which literally means squat. I love when you've got the facts, you argue the facts. When you've got the law, you argue the law. When you've got neither, you just talk louder. So there are leagues when they have good youth participation, they, they scream. Look at us, we've got a pipeline. For crying out loud, me love that's that's Rob Manford, the commissioner of baseball. That's his entire gimmick is getting young people to play baseball, getting people into the pipeline, make them major leaguers or make them major league fans or season ticket holders. I get it. Soccer academies sprouting up like weeds. Every MLS team says, let's start an academy. We did that in baseball. Get us a stadium. We'll get you an academy. How's the academy in Miami doing? It's thriving. Not. So you put kids into academy, you let them grow up, and then they become really good and they say to themselves, I have an idea, I'm gonna play in Major League Soccer. Nope, that's not what they say. They say, if I'm really good, I'm going to the EPL. If I get offered 75 million a year, I may go to Saudi Arabia. How do you feel about Syria? No one goes to MLS unless they can't go outside the US. So what Major League Soccer has become is basically a minor league system. And if you look at a minor league team in baseball, like a AAA team, you've got some prospects, but you've got younger players who don't have tremendous upside who need more seasoning because the best minor league players go from AA right to the big leagues. Or you've got great prospects who got called up from double A, did not do well, get sent back down to triple A instead of double A because they didn't turn out the way you thought they would, and maybe they will again. Or you've got in triple A veterans, guys who've been around the league for a long time who are not really good enough to be in the big leagues anymore, but they provide your system with depth. Veteran depth, we would call it. We'd have budgets for VD and I don't mean one that requires a Z-Pack. Veteran depth. Do people know that? Anyway, Z-Packs can cure just about anything. So that's what AAA is in baseball. Major League Soccer, we have the big announcement, hey, Lionel Messi's coming to Miami. Hip, hip, hooray. Messi is on the 17th green at the moment of his soccer life. Ronaldo is on the 17th green, and that's why he's considering going to Saudi Arabia for a three and a half year, $300 million deal. 37 years old. But what Major League Soccer has successfully done so far 
is they have expanded. And that is a thing that businesses do when they feel as though that what they're not accomplishing in a small way, if they go large, they will then be able to accomplish in both a micro and a macro way. And I've told you the economic lesson that if you're losing money on each team or on each sale or on each item that you make, you don't start making money because you make more. It doesn't work that way. Sports teams inside a league could be different if there are untapped cities where there can be major corporate sponsorship deals, major, major local gate revenue. We saw how well the Seattle Sounders do in Seattle. We saw how not well Inter Miami does in Fort Lauderdale. But what Major League Soccer under Don Garber, who's always trying to get to the big boys table, he decided that his best plan would be to expand. Then his best plan would be to try to plant some academies. Then his best plan would be to expand again. Then his best plan would be to try to get some names, but make sure that very little money goes to the players. Have you looked at how Major League Soccer salaries compare to EPL? It's the equivalent of asking Max Verstappen to go to your local Elmer's, which is like your go-kart place down by the river. Hey, come drive with us twice a week. And he would say, "What? why? Why would I bother when I have a full slate where I'm getting paid 55 million? Oh, because it's in your country? No, not good enough, don't care. All the patriotism we feel about watching the USA during the World Cup, isn't that tempered slightly when you don't hear of anyone playing in our own league? Can you imagine, just for a minute, the USA dream team in basketball or an Olympic basketball team where when you look at them, you say, wow, I'm so proud of our team. And the minute the Olympics ends, they all go play in the Italian league. You wouldn't think of it, would you? Because if you're a basketball player, you want to get to America. If you're a football player, American football, you want to get to America. If you're a baseball player, it's nice to play in Japan. It's nice to play in Korea or Taiwan or Venezuela or the Dominican or anywhere else. But if you succeed, you want to get to the USA. In soccer, it's the exact opposite. If you are good, you want to get out of the USA. So how do we change that? It's like turning around a barge in the East River. It takes 49 different back up, go forward, back up, go forward. It's like watching a kid parallel park these days. They don't even teach it anymore because you just press a button and bing, bang, boom, you're parallel parking. You used to have to learn how to actually do it. Now it takes people 20 tries. Next time you see that at your local mall or on the street where you live, think about what Major League Soccer is trying to accomplish. It's going to take forever. But what they've done is tried to speed up the process by making you believe that there is demand for their product that does not exist. And they manifested that demand with the deal with Apple where all of their streaming rights went to Apple and all you have to do is pay $14.99 a month. Of course, if you have an Apple TV subscription, you can pay $12.99 a month. I'm trying to figure out the number of people right now who are willing to pay 15 bucks a month to watch Major League Soccer. We haven't seen sign-up numbers quite yet. Will there be some sort of tail some sort of afterglow of the World Cup if the USA continues to advance. No, because I wanna watch the players who I'm getting to know in the USA. I'm more apt to go to CBS or to go to the partners of EPL. Coke and I were talking about the show and uh, about this segment and he wanted to make sure I pointed out, and this is, by the way, the end of the story. The top 10 highest paid players, American highest paid, um, paid players, only one of those top 10 is American. So of the top 10 players, 
Let me do that again, Coca. I'm going to say it in a way that won't confuse people. Ready? 2669. Of the top 10 highest paid soccer players in the world, only one player is American. That is not correct, Coca. Then tell me in my ear what it is. You're telling me while I'm talking, only one player in the top 10 highest paid is American born in Major League Soccer. Oh, I could read it. <laughs> All right, ready? Two, three, nine. Knockout is the nothing personal word of the day. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going back. Only one player in the top 10 highest paid is American born. What he really meant to say is, and he wrote this, in Major League Soccer of the top 10 highest paid players, only one is American. Okay, got it. That proves the point, doesn't it? I'm not giving up on soccer in the U.S., but if I'm baseball, I'm not exactly panicked either. What about in 2026? Because we're going to get years of buildup now. We're going to get the World Cup glow. USA gets past Netherlands. They get into the quarterfinals. How amazing would that be? And all of a sudden, you realize that four years from now, North America is hosting this World Cup. Not the United States, North America. Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Majority of games in the U.S., but it's not like in Qatar when, where they're all within 10 miles of each other. You're going to have stadiums all over our country hosting World Cup games. It's going to be impossible to see as many games in the 26 World Cup as it was to see in the 22 World Cup. But you have a far less chance of getting your hand cut off. And I guarantee you that Budweiser will be able to sell beer. So we'll build it up for four years. We're going to invest money. You're going to see FIFA investing money in North America as part of following up on all the bribes where they invest money in the federations, local federations, build some academies, get some young players into the pipeline. They're not going to be ready by 26. My ideal, were I to be planning the invasion of soccer into the U.S., would be to have the, a team be good in 22 great in 26 and win it and host it in 30. Because if you're good in 22, the way we are now, I can drum up some interest. I'm gonna keep the interest going through 26 as the kids go from eight years old to 12 years old and they're getting to be good at soccer. We're gonna have a great World Cup in 2026, but not quite win. The Jerry Reinsdorf School of Managing, we're gonna finish in the semis. Then, as we head toward 2030, with players playing in their third World Cup, some of them from this year's team, because we've got such a young team, a whole new group of players in their second World Cup, and then a Beckham-like player, a Messi-like player, an American-born player who is now playing at 10 years old, will be on the team in 30 as a teenager as we win the cup that we're hosting. So the timing of all this is off by four years in my opinion, and you're gonna see the results, which are that Major League Soccer is not gonna be able to continue to increase the value of their teams the way it has recently. They've hit sort of a very hard top in my mind. They're gonna keep trying to expand, which is their way of getting owners money and their way of saying, hey, we're popular because look all the markets who want us. But at the end of the day, take a look at the salaries of the players in MLS and take a look at where the best players in the world are playing because it won't be MLS. Now hosting the World Cup for North America is a totally different ball game than what Qatar went through. Qatar spent hundreds of billions of dollars all in an effort, as their sheiks have told you, to let the world know of all the good things that are going on in Qatar, all the great resources they have, all the great laws they have, all of the freedom they have, and just how much peace is going on in that region. No fear. So they get awarded the World Cup in a totally nefarious way bribe central. Now they're having the World Cup. There's plenty of empty seats going on. And yesterday, one of the guys from FIFA Uncovered, the spokesman for the Qatar bid and now the hosting of the Qatar, he did an interview where he said, by the way, we're good. All that, all those numbers out there are a bunch of horse hockey. 
6,000 workers didn't die. It was only like 400 or 400 or 500 workers died. Um, what about the workers who didn't die? Are they allowed to leave? Well, well, no, of course not. We take their passports when they come into the country and they're totally indentured servants like you're like slaves. You know what I'm talking about. That's what they are. But we but look at the life we're giving them. Well, they're living 20 to a room with no plumbing. No, but they get jobs way better than if they had stayed home. But why can't they leave? Well, because we've got more work for them to do. But guess what? <laughs> they get a free ticket to a game. But that's not why Qatar hosted the World Cup in order to take advantage of all these low-cost laborers, slave wages. They hosted because they thought and hope that at the end of this 2022, you would be so excited with your nation, with your team, that you would forget what goes on in Qatar. And that's the definition of sports washing. They worked for nine years. They got awarded this in 2009. So we are 13 years later. They worked for nine years building and getting ready. But for 13 years, they tried to build a team. And the Qatari team was eliminated in the group stage after two games, I believe their total amounts of goals scored, Coca, was it 0. 0.0? 0. Points zero. You would think with all of the money they have that they would have been able to bring in some players for World Cup. Maybe they didn't realize that to play in the World Cup team, you had to actually be a Qatari. They scored one goal against Senegal the entire tournament. I guess they can rest on that. So what I want to say about Qatar is I tie a bow on them because I'm not going to talk about their national team anymore. We are going to focus on what the USA is doing on the field and focus on the World Cup as they head toward the World Cup final December 18th. Tying a bow on it means I am deeming this World Cup an abject failure. A failure because it did not accomplish for Qatar what they wanted, what they expected, what they needed, what they figured, what they thought, and what we're going to hear as the World Cup comes to an end is that they did all those things. And I can't wait for the press conference. I can't wait for FIFA's president, Giovanni Infantini to stand up at the end, congratulate Qatar, talk about what a great success it was. I wonder whether it'll cross his fingers and toes or whether it'll keep his hands in his pockets rubbing over the wad of $100 bills. Totally disingenuous. Don't get fooled. Watch the USA, enjoy the World Cup, but don't think for a minute that what Qatar set out to do they've accomplished and don't let them forget what kind of hellhole, racist, disgusting country they run. Okay. Hmm. I said to Coca yesterday as we were talking about today's show, um, or two days ago, I was talking about the USA-Iran Iran game, and I was concerned about a draw. And he said, listen, I really think that they are gonna win and make it to the knockout and make it out to the knockout stage. So my pick of the day yesterday was USA winning. And of course, I have to give credit to Coca for that. And he looked at Iran and he said, in his mind, he sees the USA as a better team and he liked the numbers on it. So that's what we took. So if you took it, you won. 136 and 117 is what our record is. The USA has advanced, as I said, get ready for Saturday. Quick game for you to watch tonight is being played in New York. I'm noticing something interesting about the NBA season. Last night, if you watched the Mavericks play the Warriors and Luka got another 40-point triple-double, that's when you score 40 points and have 10 or more assists and rebounds. Those are not easy to get, and Luka gets them like he's going to get a quarter pounder. And the Mavericks are a 500 team. The need for teams to have their big three that era, I'm concerned that that era may be over and that's really good for fans of different teams where building a team may be the better way to go over the long run, like you do in baseball where you tank for a while and then you try to get good, where you sprinkle in some good names, but you have a good 
team, not focused on one, two, or three good players. Look at the season that Indianapolis is having, the Pacers, the Sacramento Kings, the Wizards. These are teams beginning to play better. But we're looking at the Bucks knicks game tonight, and the Knicks are an example. And the reason I brought this up is the Knicks are a team that don't have a big three. They don't have a big one, except they signed Jalen Brunson. They're still playing around 500. They're still on the outside looking in, trying to get in the play-in tournament. How can the Knicks have been this bad for this long? It's now been 23 seasons since they made it to the finals in 1999 against the Spurs. And it's not like they've been close ever since. Meanwhile, the Bucks, the Bucks, Milwaukee, I love Milwaukee. Milwaukee is not New York. How do the Bucks find a way to surround Giannis with people to the point where they get a ring and they are competitive year in and year out with Giannis? Now he's the greatest player in the league. What about us? Bucks minus five and a half over the Knicks. Maybe the Bucks will give the Knicks a break, but I'm still giving the points. That's my pick of the day. Bucks five and a half over the Knicks. All right, we come back. We are going to review a mini series, but get ready for something fun today. We're doing a Zoom meeting for you. I am doing a Zoom meeting between the Mets and Carlos Rodon. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It is Wednesday. November 30th. Thank you for rating and reviewing, telling your friends about us. I'm still watching something. This was at your suggestion. Please keep sending me your suggestions. I love it. You guys are so good at knowing what I like to watch. Almost everything you suggest that I watch, I like. Killer Sally is what we're reviewing today. And I have a serious question about Killer Sally. Killer Sally is about a bodybuilder who's married to a bodybuilder. They all do steroids. Then they're surprised when there's steroid rage. Then there's murder. I was engrossed. I enjoyed all the episodes. It's, it's short, three episodes, I think. And I was surrounded by steroids most of my career. I've seen steroid ra rage and anger and acne and everything that comes with it. What continues to surprise me about this show and about this sport, why is bodybuilding a sport when by definition to do it, you have to take steroids? You don't have to take steroids to be a baseball player. You don't have to take steroids to play golf. They do, but you don't have to. You don't have to take PDs to play football, but Toradol helps. But those sports have clean people and dirty people. Who's clean in bodybuilding? You don't get those bodies by going to the gym five times a day. Trust me. So watch Killer Sally with your kids, if you don't mind. Watch Killer Sally with your spouse. Watch Killer Sally if there was ever a thought in your brain to take a PED or a supplement. Try not to have the ego of the players who do it because the odds are you're not gonna be able to monetize it. Players like a Barry Bonds, he, could, he monetized it. Brady Anderson monetized it. Never, never tested positive, oh no. Didn't do it. Go look at some stats and then tell me who did what. How are you going to monetize it? Because you think you look good? Killer Sally, check it out of what not to do. Okay, let me see what the password is here, Coca. I need a, um, when I click it, it doesn't work. I have a meeting that starts in one minute. Okay, I got to click. If I click that, Carlos, one second, I'm getting there. Hey, hey, minions. Yeah, it's Boris. I mean, I mean, Boris. Can you help me here? I can't get on. I can't get on. I can't get on. You better get me on right now or I'm going to fire you so fast. Carlos, I got you, buddy. I got you. We're going to have a great meeting. Hold on one second. Carlos is going to put you on mute. I cannot find the password, you mother. 
Just click it, Mr. Boris. It's right here. Just click, click it, click it. Just right there. Okay, Carlos, can, can you hear me, Carlos? Okay, the Mets are gonna be on in one minute. I, I want you, what are you wearing? I can't see, oh no, Carlos, Carlos, I don't want you in a hoodie. I want you in pants and a button down shirt, okay? All right, remember, it's Steve Cohn and Billy Epler. That's who's gonna be on the Zoom, all right? Okay, don't talk until I say, Carlos, what's your view of blank? And when I ask what your view is of the Mets, I want you to say it's the only place you wanna play because what you care about is a first-class organization and you care about having pieces around you, okay? Any questions from the Mets? That's all I want you to say. All right, I'll be right, I'll be right in. I'm gonna let you in the room in a minute. I can't see anybody. Oh, well, get him on. Steve, how are you? It's Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time. I hope that you've received the FedEx from me that has the book on Carlos Rodon. I know, I had to pay extra freight. It's about 169 pages, but I wanted you to see everything that he can bring to your team because he is the missing piece to your World Series championship. You put him right there with Max Scherzer, and I'm telling you, you've got yourself a ring, Steve. Um, Scott, it's Billy. Yeah, I, Billy, one second. Let me just finish with Steve. Hey, Steve, take a look at what he did for the San Francisco Giants last year. You're not going to believe it. 31 starts. But what's better than that is he's got so many pitches left in his arm because he has not pitched a full season almost ever. You're getting him right now at his prime, at his best. Take a look at page 69 of my portfolio, if you don't mind. And I want you to see that I have shown every single game he pitched last year for the Giants and what would have happened if he had been wearing a Met uniform for every one of those starts and what would have happened to your team all the way through the playoffs. Right. I, Steve, do you see it? No, Billy, one second. I'm not ready for you yet. Carlos, not yet. Steve, my man. All we're asking for, and this is so reasonable because, Steve, I want you to win. You have no idea how important it is to me that your organization gets that World Series. I mean, I may have season tickets in LA, but I watch every one of your games. It would be so good for you to win one before the Yankees. Hey, where's the mute button? Oh, one second, Steve. Carlos, I'm saying this, don't worry. I'm saying this because I want the Mets to win World Series because then the Yankees are gonna have to raise their payroll and I'm gonna put more of my guys, not you, you're gonna be signed, but I'm gonna put other guys there. Yeah, hold on, okay. Unmute it. Steve. So here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna need six years. I know that may sound like a lot, but I've got five from four other teams. And let me tell you something, two of those teams are in your division. And one of those teams may have won a World Series recently, and the other one may have been in the World Series recently, but I can't tell you which teams they are. But you don't want me sending him inside your division. I mean, you are gonna hurt the Giants by taking him, but more importantly, you're not gonna lose your division again. Not with Carlos. Um, Scott, this is Billy. I was just wondering, uh, we don't see him really as a six year fit. So, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think we can, we can get to that. Um, Scott, this is Steve. Could you please ignore my general manager, please? Billy, only speak when you're spoken to, and you're not in charge anyway. Hey, Scott, we'll consider six, but you really think that we're gonna go to $200 million for, for Rodon? We just can't. You have to look at our luxury tax bill. They named the whole damn thing after me. If we give him that kind of money, what are we gonna give to Jacob? Oh, well, I'm telling you that right now, if you go over six years, Carlos is a way better fit for your team than DeGrom. Now, if you can get to Grom on a one or two year deal, maybe we can talk about that. But for me, having Rodon for six, that's the way to go. But that's what it's gonna take. Well, well, Scott, can we just ask Carlos a question? Sure. Okay. Hey, Carlos, good to see you. It's it's Billy. Hey, hey, Billy. How are you? Good. Hey, um, 
How do you feel right now? Well, well, Billy and Steve, I just know that I want to be a New York Met. And my feeling about the Mets is that I'm going to go out there every five days and I want to know what it's like to have a parade down Broadway because I absolutely love the Colorado Rockies. Oh, so, sorry. Did, was that, are we being recorded? Scott, you, you put the Rockies on my, on my thing, on my sheet. Sorry. I love the New York Mets. Folks, these Zoom meetings are a joke. When you meet with free agents, that's not how it goes. When you meet with their agent, Scott Boris tries to go through his entire book with you and you tell him to bugger off and you just go right to what you're willing to offer. And he says, we're gonna need another year and we're gonna need another 5 million per year, but that's a very nice start. And then you MF him, hang up, and you go on to the next free agent until your owner calls you and says, you gotta call him back and get this done. That's really how it goes. Carlos Rodon getting five years. Take a look at his career. Does it make sense to you when you've had one good year to do that? Now, granted, he had a good year. But how many times did teams get screwed? How many? Steve Cohn is a P.T. Barnum sucker. He is the perfect person for Boris to take advantage of. He did it with Scherzer, getting two years at 43 million, making him the highest paid player. Are you kidding me? Wait to see when I tell you something's gonna happen. If it does, we'll talk about it. If it doesn't, we'll talk about it. Guess what? As desperate as Steve Cohn is, and as useless as Billy is in a negotiation with Scott because Boras will only deal with owners, even Cohn will not give in and sign Carlos Rodon. The Mets will not sign him. Sorry, Coca, sorry, Scott. I know you don't care, you just want every player on your team. I get it. He's not gonna be a Met. All right, Coca. You know what I want? <laughs> I wanna talk to Samson. So you wanna talk to Samson. That is a something that we do, which is from a movie, Half Baked, which is a great movie. There's a character named Samson, and people always want to talk to him. They really want weed, but they really want to talk to him, get life advice. Get on my Twitter at David P. Samson or Instagram at David P. Samson. Ask me a question, and we may put it on the air because it may interest us. Hi, David. Can you explain the process when teams ask permission to interview another team's executive or coach? Is that permission needed or just out of respect? And why would a team give permission for another team to potentially poach an effective executive or well-liked coach? I love that question. I get asked that a lot on the street. I'm not really walking on the street. You don't get asked questions like that. But people have spoken to me about that at cocktail parties. We were a team who invented and started promoting people to bigger titles to avoid them from being poached. We identified Larry Beinfest as someone we didn't want to lose, so we named him president of baseball operations. Back when it was not popular for your GM to be a president of baseball operations, we then had an assistant GM named Mike Hill, who we moved up to GM. The reason why you give people higher titles and bigger titles is that when another team asks permission, it has to be granted only if two conditions exist. One, there is a contractual clause that allows for permission to be granted. And two, it is for a higher position in the food chain of baseball or business operations. If you are a GM and another team wants to interview to be GM, the team who has them has the ability and the right to say no. If you are a GM and another team is asking for a president of baseball operations and you're only employing him as a quote unquote GM, in theory, you have to give that person permission to interview. The problem is the job as president of baseball operations is the same as the job as GM. Don't let it fool you when all these president of baseball operations say, oh, I'm involved in so many other things. Horse hockey, they are general managers. 
we would sign people to contracts where we would tell them up front that no matter which teams come, no matter what title, we are not giving permission. In return for that, we're giving you a five-year deal with security, and in this world, that means everything. In the baseball world, it means everything, where you know you and your family are gonna be in the same place for five years, employed and working. But just know that if someone comes to you to be GM or President Baseball Ops, our answer is no. So if you wanna sign it, sign it, get the security, but we don't wanna worry about permission. What we would do is identify several people in the organization who we felt that way about, sign them to long-term deals, not give permission, and then allow anyone else to go. There are teams and owners who get excited when their people are asked permission because they wanna be part of the tree, right? That's really cool. Hey, it's an Andrew Friedman tree. We have Andrew Friedman, he goes to the Dodgers, we've got the next Andrew Friedman, then he goes to the Red Sox, we've got the next guy, and it just shows how good we are at going through executives. Our owner and I, we were never like that. I didn't need other teams to make me feel better about my hiring. If we were comfortable with someone who we thought was effective, good at their job, and we could work with, why make change for change's sake, Why make change because it makes you feel good about your initial hire? The only reason that Major League Baseball and the commissioner's office get involved in this is they want openings for minorities. And the interesting thing about having openings for minorities is that those openings get blocked by these promotions via title only. We did it with a minority, Mike Hill, we made him GM because we didn't want him going anywhere. Then we made him president of baseball operations because he deserved to be, and we didn't want him going anywhere. But we don't look at, as I've told you before, as I've said on different shows, we do not focus on color. We focus on who is able to work with us and help us in the best possible way. Major League Baseball doesn't care about how teams are operated. They care about the statistics. That's it. So I hope that gives you an answer to your question. We don't ever view it as holding people back because we pay them, and that's really what people want. Well, actually, I would say to employees at some point, hey, do you care more about money or title? And I would love the employees who said they cared more about title because it's so much easier to give out title than it is money right? It's great. When people say, I don't care what you call me, just give me a substantial raise. Those are the smart ones. So if you're in your company and you're offered a better title with no pay raise, tell them to screw off. Tell them you don't care about the better title. You want the raise. Employers who give you titles without money are taking advantage of you. I promise. Well, Don Mattingly certainly wasn't out of work long. Are you shocked by that? He's a baseball guy. When we hired him from the Dodgers to become a manager of the uh, Marlins, there's something about what he loved to do, and he would talk to us, and he meant it. He said, you want to cut the payroll, cut the payroll. You want to sign free agents, sign free agents. I love working with players. It is so rare that a superstar wants to work with players these days because they're so entitled and so rich and make more in a year than he made in a career. Don Mattingly, he's a special kind of man, a special kind of father and husband, a special kind of baseball person. Don Mattingly loves the grind of the game. He works his ass off because he wants players to be better than he was. He wants players to be better trained, to have longer careers, to understand the nuances of the game. He understands and is okay with analytics, but he also uses his eyes and his gut. He's like a throwback. But his depth of knowledge makes him an asset. And the Marlins under Bruce Sherman and Derek Jeter had no idea what they had. They thought it was time for a new voice. Kim Ang, I guess, thought, hey, I want to hire my own manager. Let's bring in Skip Schumacher. He's the new up-and-coming guy. It's always funny, right? Is this how older people feel when they're replaced by younger people? It's the shiny new toy. I've been downgraded. I've been changed out for someone new and younger. Baseball is not like that. 
I mean, I'm not talking about Tony La Russa type of old, but Don Mattingly is no Tony La Russa. Don Mattingly is an absolute bonus to any organization he joins. And rumors are out today that Mattingly is not out of work any longer. He is going to be the bench coach for the Toronto Blue Jays. So what's interesting to me about this decision is that when president of baseball operations guys or GMs or team presidents, when they get let go, they have a hard time going back into the game as something less than what they were. Like, hey, I was a GM, I don't wanna be a professional scout. Hey, I was the president of a team, I'm not gonna go run the finance department or the marketing department when I was running the whole damn thing. There are managers who believe that they are, you know, let's say a Joe Madden, you don't see him becoming bench coach of any team anymore, he was that. Well, Don Maddenly was a bench coach, then he became a manager, and you'd think with his resume that he would hold out to become a manager again, but no, that's not what he's doing because he loves the game. The Yankees and the Red Sox and the Rays got hurt today because what Don Mattingly brings to Toronto will make the Blue Jays better. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. just got better today. So did Bichette, Biggio, wait for it. You normally think bench coaches don't matter, right? If you're inside a clubhouse, you know exactly what a bench coach does. You know how prepared they help get the manager and the players. You may not know how much time they spend with the players because players are more apt to go to a bench coach than they are to a manager because they feel like it's easier to communicate to a bench coach than a manager because they're intimidated by a manager. Now, I'm not sure who John Schneider intimidates at 42 years old. First year manager, he was their interim last year when they fired Montoyo. But bringing in a veteran guy like Mattingly, if the Blue Jays go south, Mattingly be in a prime position to become manager of that team. You know what Don Mattingly's doing today before he took that job? He's calling John Schneider. You know what he's saying to John? Right in the beginning, first interview. Hey, John, just so you know, I'm not here for your job. It's the opposite. I'm here because I want you to be manager of the year. I'm here because I want to see you guys win a World Series. And I'm here because I want to work with your team and I want to win. That's how good a person Mattingly is. There's plenty of veteran bench coaches who are just waiting. They're hoping for a slow start so they can get moved right up to manager. That ain't Mattingly, I'll tell you that. All right, I wanna draw your attention to a story that happened a couple days ago that we did not give enough attention to. Uh, and I wanna just point it out here as this show comes to an end. It's about Lamar Jackson, the quarterback for the Ravens. Lamar Jackson sent out a tweet where he was criticizing and fighting with someone on Twitter who had criticized him after their most recent game. I don't, I, the number of times we tell our players not to engage with fans is significant. Nothing good happens when you engage with fans other than signing autographs, taking a photo, and thanking them for being a fan. Engaging with fans who are booing you or who are, have cyber courage or keyboard courage as I call it, you can't win ever. There's nothing you'll be able to say back where the person who wrote it will say, hey, that made sense, I was wrong. Your best chance to convert a hater to a lover is in person. Your best chance to convert a hater to a lover is by having the hater get out from behind the screen and actually meet you and see that you're a normal good guy. Lamar Jackson did not give his hater a chance and instead sent a tweet back that included an expression, eat a blank, go back to eating blanks. And people thought that was homophobic. He then deleted the tweet, apologized for the tweet, said in no way was that meant to be homophobic. Then he had a meet with his coach, Harbaugh, who said, I know Lamar Jackson, he ain't homophobic. Well, I've taken it upon myself to do a little field study. There are plenty of homosexual people who I know, and I asked every single one of them in a very neutral way, and 50% of those asked didn't know about the story. 25% did not know who Lamar Jackson was. But I asked about the expression. Are you ready? Not one took it as a sign of homophobia. 
Not one. My concern is, is that all of the hatred and all of the discrimination and all of the misogyny and all of the homophobia that does exist has now leaked to a point where it is a assumption that is made that if you say something, that there is some sort of vitriol behind it. The benefit of the doubt has now been removed for all of us. No matter what position you take, if you get even close to a line regarding sex, gender, race, and you have no ill intention at all, you're likely to be misunderstood more than Elvis Costello, and you are in trouble. That's why Lamar Jackson got rid of his tweet, deleted his tweet, because he didn't want it out there that there was even a possibility that could be misinterpreted. So what's the best way to avoid it? I guess the best way is to just never say anything for fear of retribution. But why do we have to take internet bullying? Just because you're a rich celebrity means you don't get bullied? It means you don't have feelings? It means it doesn't impact you when someone who you don't know talks about how much they hate you or how much you suck and you're just supposed to take it. Well, you get paid 20 million a year. Of course, you're going to take it. That's not right. People who make 20 million a year and people who make 20,000 a year, they still are built from the same wiring. I don't blame Mark Jackson at all for what he did. I don't blame him for deleting the tweet either. But I ask you as you go forward, as you use social media as a bully pulpit, what are you getting from that? And when you respond to people who are using it as a bully pulpit, what are you accomplishing from doing that response? If you would just remember that it's just business, it's always nothing personal.